All right. Welcome back, everybody. Um, we're going to keep right on along with Ryan. Um, how's it going, Ryan? Good, thank you. How are you? Pretty good. Awesome. And we can hear you perfectly. Um, so we're going to kick things right off. If you have any questions, you can head it to the day two Ryan channel and put them there so we can get them answered. Um, and then, yeah, you're ready to get going? Absolutely. All right, let's go. All right, let me go ahead and... All right, so I am super excited to do this. It's I know everyone's been waiting a few months to get these talks out. Um, I'll be talking about visualizing Kotlin flow in Android. Uh, Kotlin flow has really evolved so quickly in the past, over the past year. Um, so it definitely had to completely rewrite everything to keep everything modern. So I hope everyone has something to take away from this, both if you're, if you're new to Kotlin coroutines or if you've used it a lot, I think there's a little bit for everyone. Before I introduce myself, I'm gonna give a little teaser about what we're talking about today. So we'll be talking about what we see here. We'll be talking about this. I'll describe what these are. And we'll be talking about this third one. So, so what are these things that we're, we're visualizing here? The first one's flow. It's just a regular cold flow with data going into a coroutine. The second one is state flow, which came out a few months back. Um, if you notice, items are going into these two coroutines, a fast and slow one, and one actually gets conflated. Uh, the second value in the slow coroutine gets conflated. And then an up and coming feature is shared flow. Um, not quite out yet, but it might be in a future release coming out soon. And you know, we'll be able to get some benefits from that, but it's it's uh, evolves on the existing flows that we've seen so far. And we'll talk about some more things in, in the Kotlin Coroutines library, and we'll even take a tour of Chicago to keep things interesting. So um, my name is Ryan Pierce. I'm currently a mobile developer. I'm, I, I work as an Android developer at Capital One, but I've been doing mobile development for quite a while now. Um, a fun fact is that I'm super passionate about space exploration, and I also was born and raised in Schaumburg, Illinois. In fact, that's where I'm giving this talk right now. So hopefully I keep things in the spirit of Chicago Roboto. But so, so let's start off with flow. Flow is sort of the first flow to be in the Kotlin coroutines library. And um, it, it's sort of your most basic part to this whole adventure that we're going on. But it's we've seen it a lot in Android development because Android has adopted Kotlin. And, and so let's go into and so how it has made its way into um, the feature development that we do every day. So why Android? The first thing is asynchrony. And I, I would argue that the majority of Android is really asynchrony, um, whether it be waiting for a user to do something, whether it be trying to read from a local database or uh, communicating with the server. Really, there's, there's sort of tons of different ways that we have to deal with asynchrony in Android. And there are bad ways of doing asynchrony, like what we see here, um, it's a classic Christmas tree of, of callbacks. Um, even, there's even a star on top. Um, so when we deal with all these different types of asynchrony, there, there needs to be better architectures that allow us to write things more clearly, more safely. Um, also, there's this big, there's been this big movement in software development as a whole, including Android, to um, follow the reactive streams, uh, like the, the design guidelines behind it. It's more of an idea and a concept than it is an implementation. And various libraries have implemented the concept behind reactive streams. And in fact, Flow is inspired by, and conceptually, Kotlin's implementation of uh, reactive streams, at least in the Kotlin coroutines library. So, so again, why Android? In Android, we want clean architectures. We want an architecture that allows us to write safe code and code that is reliable. And a lot of what Flow inherits in terms of clean architecture comes from the coroutine library. Um, we get reactivity from the coroutine library, mainly from suspension. Uh, it, it's coroutines are safe. There's a lot built into coroutines and channels that come from the idea of making sure we avoid the pitfalls of asynchrony. And it's designed to be performant. There's a ton of engineering 
uh, mind power that goes into the design behind coroutines and flows. So we wind up with these architectures that are extremely reliable. Uh, flows are also super ergonomic, and I always call flows ergonomic. And what I mean by that is it feels good to use them. Um, we can look at the example below. Let's imagine we're shopping for apples. Um, what do we do? Uh, first, first thing we do is on start, we get a basket. We filter for apples that aren't rotten. On each apple, we put it in the basket. We look for exceptions, and then we launch the coroutine, in this case a flow, in some sort of scope. Um, and, and it's very simple. You, you, you can write things very clearly that's very easy to read in these sort of, in, in these sort of um, in syntax. So we get these flows that are simple. They're very flexible. You know, we could always add in a new line to our flows, and, and they're just simply reliable. It's something that I've always seen in the Kotlin coroutines library. So, like I said, coroutine or flows are heavily built into the Kotlin coroutine library, and to a certain extent, flows are coroutines. Um, and and one of the really important things we need to understand about coroutines is suspension. So. Coroutines are often compared to lightweight threads or pretty callbacks, and, and there's, there's merit to both analogies. Uh, but what I think is really unique about coroutines is suspension. So we might have two suspending functions, one called get value, one called get next value. And when we launch them in a coroutine, what we'll see is as the coroutine is running, it has the ability to suspend. And, and we can write this sort of synchronous looking code that can actually pause and perform these asynchronous operations. If you are unfamiliar with suspension, you can think of it as being like hitting the pause button on the old VCR or DVD player or Netflix. Um, basically, unlike other asynchronous systems that wind up blocking your threads or um, just sort of hang, coroutines have the ability to really pause and then resume later using a continuation object. But the other real superpower that comes with coroutines is structured concurrency. Um, it was something added in later on, but it's just so incredibly powerful. And the way that it works is we create a scope. And when we use that scope, we have to have that when we launch coroutines. Basically, coroutines have to be launched in a scope. And so if we launch, say, three coroutines, um, we, we want to make sure this gets cleaned up. And we can do that with by canceling a scope. And, and, and so it makes it so that the big challenge of like the thread world where we have to clean up our resources and we don't want to leak resources, um, it, it makes a lot of that a lot easier for us as developers to um, control and manage. So the other thing that's in the coroutine library are channels. And if you've been following the evolution of the coroutine library, you'll see that we're starting to migrate away from channels and using more flows in our in our applications, our, our apps, our use cases. Um, but, but channels are a very, very important part of the coroutines library, and flows are also heavily built on channels. Now, if you haven't used a channel before, um, basically the way that they work is we have a coroutine that produces values. And in this case, a fan out channel can have multiple coroutines consuming those values. But instead of a broadcast type uh, behavior, what you wind up seeing is the values from the producer coroutine get split amongst the, the consuming coroutines. So value two goes into processor two, not one. And they get split until the producer coroutine is exhausted of all of its values. So where channels plug in is this idea from CSP um, called share by communicating. It, 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 the, the analogy comes from the Go language, but the idea is that we don't want shared mutable state, and channels allow us to effectively share by communicating. Again, avoiding, avoiding some of the pitfalls that come from uh, asynchronous computation. So cold streams. Flows at the end of the day are these cold, non-blocking data streams. And, and I'll do a quick example. Imagine we have a flow of one, two, and three. They're just pieces of data. And we launch a coroutine with the flow numbers and we call collect. So the first thing that we see here is numbers is this blue uh, prism rectangle, and it represents the flow builder. Um, in this case, it's just flow of one, two, three. But when we call collect, what happens is we also get a flow collector. 
And what they do is they work in tandem to allow us a cold flow to start to activate and start streaming values. So we pass the implementation to our flow collector, in this case, update UI, which we see at the bottom of the screen. And what will happen is as soon as we call this terminal operator collect, that's when the flow becomes active. It wasn't active until we called a terminal operator. And for this particular flow, now that we've called and provided a flow collector, the values can then stream through the flow going back and forth between the flow collector and the flow emitter until all the values are emitted and the flow closes. But what's really cool is this really basic flow is actually one coroutine. Um, there's not a whole lot of resources going into this, so it's very simple and it's very efficient. Um, it's cold because uh, the production of values is actually dependent on observation, and that's the terminal operator collect. And it's non-blocking because it's in a coroutine, meaning we can suspend when we want to resume some sort of other process or we need to wait. And channels fit into this model. Um, let's say we were to add a buffer. We want to sort of smooth out emissions and collector collecting objects. What that does is it adds a buffer channel in between the uh, collector coroutine that we saw before and a new emitter coroutine. If we were to change the dispatcher in our uh, coroutine's context, we would also get a buffered flow in the middle. So channels play a really important role in making flows very flexible without us having to really figure out the underlying implementation. So flows being in the coroutine library are, like I said before, are reactive. And, and I'll give you a good example. Let's say we have an app that populates a, a list view of users. So we have a user flow on the left that is collecting users, and it's submitting it to our recycler view uh, adapter. What's happening is every time we get a user, it, the collect operator is running and submitting our list. But when there isn't a new item being emitted from the flow, collect suspends, or, or coroutine suspends. And that allows us to create these very elegant reactive architectures uh, without a lot of mental energy. It just, it just plugs in really well. And it's structured. It, it benefits, flows benefit that other major superpower of coroutines in that we can use structured concurrency. So if we launch our coroutine in the lifecycle scope, we observe these values from the user flow um, starting at the lifecycle start of the activity um, all the way up until the activity is destroyed um, or, or somewhere within that range to the point that we aren't keeping this resource open beyond the life cycle of the activity. So it's structured, it's clean. We, we don't have to put too much energy into making a reactive architecture uh, that is reliable. It actually is in fact hard to leak resources when you use structured concurrency because uh, coroutines have to be started within a particular coroutine scope. So that's a basic idea of what flow is. Um, I hope that was a good like sort of um, primer on how flow works. And, and we come back to this animation where we see basically how, you know, what flow looks like in an animated sense at its very basis or, yeah. But there's this new feature that we've seen come out that is a little bit different from the regular flow that we're used to. And it's called state flow and it fits this very, somewhat narrow but very popular use case of state management. And there's a key difference. So flow is naturally cold, and that means that, like I said before, production of values is dependent upon observation, specifically calling collect. Um, there are hot flows out there that aren't state flow, but um, mainly the idea behind flow is that it's cold. With state flow, it, it's inherently hot. You have some sort of thing producing values, could be a coroutine, it could be really anything but you can attach multiple observers that are all collecting from the same data source. Some collectors might be slow, some might be fast. And one of the inherent properties that you may have already noticed from our animation is that the way we handle back pressure for slow collectors is conflation. If a slow collector is, is uh, waiting too long and taking too long to process, we start dropping values. And you can see in the slow collector, it dropped number two right there. So, so let's help go and apply this and sort of break what, what we've been doing. And let's go into a tour of Chicago. It's going to be a, a little Android app demo. 
So uh, if you haven't been here, we're going to go to Navy Pier first. It was built in 1916 on top of 20,000 wood logs. Um, when I practiced this with my mom, she she like kind of made a scary face. I'm, I've never heard anything bad about the structural integrity. Maybe they reinforced it, but um, Navy Pier is awesome. I, I, I think you should definitely go if you haven't been there already. It's an awesome place. Uh, the next place that we'll go is Lincoln Park Zoo. Um, admission is free and it was opened up in 1868. Uh, it's one of the first zoos in America apparently. And it's also just like Navy Pier, it's awesome. And lastly, the Adler Planetarium. Um, this was actually America's first planetarium. Um, being passionate about space, I just love going there. Um, but these are the three places that we're gonna visit in our demonstration. And so, so let's first tour this on a single normal map. So first we go to Navy Pier, then Lincoln Park Zoo, and Adler Planetarium. So let's imagine that those three locations were locations from a GPS, and we're trying to render these locations onto a map. So we have a mutable state flow of GPS results. It's initialized with GPS result on standby, and I'll get into why we have that later. We then publicly expo expose the mutable state flow using a regular state flow so we can observe it. And then we have to provide values into this mutable state flow. So what I'll do is I'll make a car routine that can go ahead and do this. It takes a flow of locations, which are GPS results. We take that flow and on each of the items emitted, we put the value into the state flow and that's how we do it. We assign value to whatever the thing that we're pushing into that mutable state flow. And then we launch it. In, in, in my case, I did this in the view model. So we launch in the view model scope. Um, this is just like saying launch and collect. It's just a, a cleaner way to do it. And we'll see this throughout the presentation. So quickly, I'll go into the data models. Um, as you saw before, I had GPS result that standby in the arguments of the constructor for mutable state flow. And the reason why is state flow has to take an initial value. And so a common pattern that we'll see to approach this is to create a sealed class where we have some sort of initial value, in this case, standby. And then when we have new locations, what we'll do is we have another data class that contains that state that you want. So it has a location object. What's location? Location just has a name like Navy Pier and a coordinate that goes along with it. Coordinate is a lat long that comes from the Google Maps uh, API. So let's go back into this demo. How did I actually observe the state flow? We have the state flow GPS results. On start, we set up the map. We do like, we set it to a type of normal view. We give it a little bit of tilt. Um, we center it on Chicago. We filter for the new location data class in the GPS result sealed class. And then we just map out the location just to sort of unwrap the location object that we want. And then on each emission from the state flow, we move the marker to the location's, excuse me, we move the marker to the uh, location's coordinate. And then finally, we launch the coroutine in the lifecycle scope. So this is in a, obviously some sort of view. So that's all cool. It, it looks sort of like how we observe normal flows. But what if I want two maps? I want to show the normal view, but I also want to show in a zoomed in view of the hybrid map. So we can see Lincoln Park Zoo on the bottom right, and we can see Adler Planetarium. So I don't want two unique cold flows that could be out of sync. I have this hot resource that I'm trying to observe. And, and that's totally fine. What we can do is state flow is perfect for that. We observe these location changes, which provide the same data source across two separate views. So for the hybrid map in the bottom left, um, we just say GPS results on start. We set up the map. In this case, it's a hybrid map. It's got a bearing of 270 degrees, a pretty sh uh, shallow tilt. And then we filter for our location object like we saw before. And then instead of moving the marker, we move the camera. So we have two different views observing the exact same state, but doing different things from that. And we launch in the lifecycle scope because it's a car routine. We want to add one more thing in there. Again, no problem. Just like we saw before, we want to add 
a new view that tells us in some a Google search about the place that we're going. GPS results, filter for the location. And instead of a map, we just have a web view. And we load a URL that just queries Adler Planetarium. And then we launch the coroutine. So a lot of you might be saying, this sounds awfully familiar. I, I know of ways we can do this. And if you're thinking more from a Kotlin perspective, you might be thinking of conflated broadcast channel. And there's a reason. This was the way that we tend to do these sort of broadcasts of state. And conceptually, state flow is very similar to conflated broadcast channel. And it is designed to replace conflated broadcast channel in the future. However, when state flow came out, I think the entire Android community went, this, this API looks awfully familiar. In fact, it looks a whole lot like live, live data. The API is identical. And, and I think that was to really make sure that there was a flexible API so that people could perform state management just like they would in the case of live data. Now, when we just had flow and live data, there were some differences in how they behaved. For really basic use cases, um, flow and live data were basically behaved the same. But if you had multiple collectors, things started to diverge a little bit. With state flow and shared flow, we're seeing a lot of that, those gaps get bridged. So it's really cool how we can see that we can do all these things that we did with the live data, we can now do in the Kotlin coroutines library with, with very little addition. So let's keep going. I want to I wanna improve this map. I don't want a Google search. I want a list of the places that I visited. And as we can see, we went to Navy Pier. We have a visit to the Lincoln Park Zoo. And Adler Planetarium is below that. So we just take out the web view. We add a recycler view. Um, and then in the same way that we filtered for locations from the state view, or state, state flow with um, the web view, Instead, what we do is we first scan. And it, scan is a really neat operator. What it does is it takes the values that are emitted from the state flow or whatever flow you have, and it accumulates them. So if I initialize an empty list of locations, it will accumulate a list of all the locations we visited. And the reason why we need that is because the recycler view in this case has submit list. So we need to submit the full list of places that we are have visited and, and are just visited. So on each, we call the adapter submit list and provide the list of places that we are visiting. I want to keep going. I want to start charting locations. I want to draw a dashed line so I can see not only the history of places I've been on the list view, but I can also see them in the, the map above. That's fine. Add a polyline. Um, I'm going to make sure that the animations are suspending. And just the way that I do that is I provide a suspend cancelable coroutine. I provide a continuation so that in animation on end, I can resume the continuation and therefore the coroutine resumes. And then I start the animation. So the reason I did this um, is because if you don't do this, the animations will just fire off and the stateful will continue to emit values. Whereas in this case, um, the, the observing coroutine, in this case, the map, will suspend while the animation is occurring. And it makes things happen a bit more synchronously when it's rendering on the screen. But this actually brought up a problem. We noticed as we went to production, some users had an issue where the map didn't match up with the list. As we can see in the list, we went to Lincoln Park Zoo. But if you notice, we skipped the Lincoln Park Zoo on the map. We went straight from Navy Pier to the Adler Planetarium. So that begs us the question, what if we move too fast? What happens if different coroutines collect at different speeds? Well, the answer in this case was conflation. Basically, because of the suspending of the animation, we took too long in our normal map view. And the Navy Pier, not Navy Pier, the Lincoln Park Zoo got conflated. Now, I want to give this example. There, there could be a number of reasons why your suspend, your coroutine could take too long. I think this was sort of a, an, a, an, a unique example. I don't know that you'd always suspend an animation. But it really represents the idea that if your coroutines are too slow, you're going to see conflation. And for your use case, that might be bad. Before, state flow worked just fine. But now that we've evolved our use case, 
state flow now brings us to a place where we no longer have all the properties that we want. So that's fine. Um, we can just set conflation equal to false or unconflate or something like that. But just kidding, you can't. State flow is has built in conflation. You can't really change that about state flow. But in, in the, the feature that's coming out soon, shared flow, uh, we no longer have that. We can configure this kind of stuff. So if we look in the animations where the slow collector skips number two in the state flow because we are conflating values, in shared flow, what happens is each collector will do its own thing and shared flow will patiently wait by suspending until all collectors have received the values. It's like uh, an event bus where each event is critical to the use case where you can no longer be conflating values. There are some more differences that are pretty important. Conflation is one of them. Um, shared flow doesn't require an initial value. Shared flow doesn't have the distinct until changed behavior that state flow has. You can configure a replay so that if new subscribers uh, observe the shared flow, they get a certain number of values back. And um, you can configure the buffer overflow strategy. So you don't have to just conflate values. You could suspend the, the shared flow effectively so that uh, you don't drop values. You could also drop latest. It's pretty, pretty flexible. So let's integrate shared flow into our application and see if that helps us. So to migrate over to shared flow, what we'll do is take our state flow and we make it a shared flow. And like you saw before, we don't need an initial value. The first argument is the replay size. Um, it also affects the buffer. Basically, the, the buffer and replay sort of act in together. But we're going to have nothing. We're going to have a buffer of 0 and a replay of 0. Next, we'll move the state flow to a shared flow. We'll just use a simple operator as shared flow. This comes out in the uh, shared flow PR. That will be out soon. And then we have. Uh, the, where we assigned value to something for state flow, we just emit like we would a normal flow. Let's see if this works. Awesome. Even though we had a slow collector, we saw all locations get mapped onto our, our Google map. And the reason why is our shared flow made all the other coroutines wait until the slow collector um, the, the slow coroutine did everything it needed to do. And it, it patiently waited. And, and that's one of the beauties of share float. It's very flexible. It fills in some of the things that we would want outside of the state flow use case. We're also going to see some cool operators like share in. So if you want to not have to have that collect coroutine emit to the share flow, you can just take a, a, a regular flow and share in using a certain scope. Same thing with state in, uh, state flow. You have a state in operator that does the same does the same sort of thing. Just keeps your code a little bit cleaner. So that's shared flow. Um, before I continue, I want to talk about a the animations that I showed. So as as you can see, you you might have looked at these animations and wondered how I made these. Um, when I was going to give this speech before, I was thinking, you know, how can I um, what, what can I use to animate? I, I looked at external libraries to animate uh, the different flows, and I, I didn't like them. And a joke came into my head. What if I used Android animations to sort of hard code uh, all of this stuff? And then the joke continued in my head. What if I wrote an extension library where you could write coroutines as you would normally, but you would dynamically generate all of these views that represent how these flows behave? So I did that. And about a week later, I had this library that I called Meteor. And, and I can show you a quick example how the library works. Uh, so for our cold flow animation that we saw before, basically, we can create a Meteor coroutine scope. We call that scope, and we, we call launch on that scope. And it's just like the normal coroutine library. And we take a flow of Meteors, and we collect them. And then we do something. As you can see on the top right, we set the background to green once the uh, piece of data, the meteor, has been collected. Um, the only difference that you'll notice is that launch passes a location object, and that allows us to, on collect, tell these meteors where they need to move on the view. 
So basically, we send them to an actor channel for the meteor, and the meteor animates it's on its way to the, the box, which is the coroutine. So for example, how do we write collect? We can just basically extend the existing collect that we get from the coroutines library. And instead of just uh, invoking some sort of lambda, we send the location to the Meteor's actor channel, which again, that channel goes and coordinates all of the animations that need to happen. And then we call the block that would normally be the flow collector. So this, this demonstration just shows you how extensible the coroutine library is. It's, it's one of the things that I've really, really loved about working with Kotlin coroutines. Um, if you wanna make it more flexible and build it the way that you want to, uh, Kotlin and the Kotlin Quarantines library with extension or extension functions and and the fact that the Kotlin Quarantines library is open, it's very easy to do that. So there's one more thing I want to talk about with with flows, and it looks sort of like this, or it might, um, and it has to do with concurrency in flows. So if I wanted to do some sort of concurrent processing within a flow, I might build something like a worker pool. And that's what we're seeing visualized here. There are a bunch of ways we can go about this, but what, what do we mean by concurrency within a flow? So aren't flows already concurrent? Um, normally when we refer to concurrency in a flow, we're saying the flow that the, the flow that we're using in a particular coroutine is concurrent with the rest of your application. Um, but what if we have transforms inside our flow that we want to happen concurrently? Remember flows sort of go back and forth between the emitter and the collector. Um, but what if we have like a filtering that we want to do that we wish we could do concurrently and, and maybe even parallel if we have the resources and threads to do that? So there is some discussion about flows that might be able to tackle this challenge. Um, it's something I'm really interested in. It's not named yet, so I'm not going to give it a name. But I will go into what's going on in the space right now. So if you wanted to do concurrency within a flow, what you might do nowadays is use a function called flat map merge. It has a concurrency argument and a transform that takes in a value and returns a flow of a value. And so the way you would use this, for example, is if we look at our apples example from before, we'd get our basket and we'd filter for is rotten and we put each item, each apple in the basket. But what if we have multiple people that can help us check the apples if they're, if they're good or not? Um, what we could do to get that sort of concurrency is use flat map merge. We'll have a limit of three for our concurrency, which is sort of like having three processes that could run. We have to take a flow of it, it being an apple, and perform the filtering. Now, there are a couple of problems that I find with flat map merge. Um, the first is that flat map merge the, the concurrency isn't explicit. Um, you probably wouldn't know that this was concurrent unless you saw the argument to the function or you just had looked through the documentation beforehand. Um, it, it's not obvious. And so someone coming into the, the coroutines library may not realize that it's concurrent or know that this is what they want if they're trying to achieve that. The second issue is that it breaks our declarative model. We have to break out into this new nesting level to do the tasks that we want, the transforms that we want uh, concurrently. We also notice that we have to create a flow in our flat map merge. Why? That's because transform, our argument to flat map merge, has to return a flow of a value, not just the transformed value. So it, it, it makes this a, a little harder to read. It's not as clear that um, what you're doing is concurrent and that the transforms just the filtering. So there are a couple ways we might tackle this in the real world um, outside of flat map merge. We might do something like a channel flow, and, and this is similar to how flat map, uh, flat map merge is, is implemented. Basically, you have a channel flow. For each item in a flow, you quickly launch a coroutine, and because coroutines are launched instantly, we just launch it for every value, and then each coroutine starts running and performs the transform and sends it into the channel flow's channel. And the channel flow just merges all these values into a flow at the end. Another way is the worker pool that I showed in a, 
as a rough animation of before, where we have not only the the merging channel, like an actor channel, but we also have a job queue where we basically submit tasks to, or jobs to a worker pool of coroutines. They go and perform the transform and send into that merging send channel. But this leads to sort of a big problem. Um, you wind up with lots of ad hoc implementations of these concurrent flows. Um, and sometimes they look just like this. There's a big problem with these two implementations that I provided. They have none of the error handling that you should probably have. They are, are not optimized for a, a production environment. But you'll see things like this in apps where people are trying to achieve concurrent flows or worker pools. And so I, I think there's a big need for really an operator that comes from the library that's well engineered. And, and the Kotlin Coroutine engineers do a great job at building these really reliable operators. I think there's a great opportunity to, to build one that allows us to, to do concurrency within flows. So, so what, what, me, what might we expect? Um, there is some discussion going on. It happen, it's happening in the GitHub issues for the Kotlin Coroutines library. I linked the issue below. If you'd like to read up on it, go ahead. It's a very interesting discussion. Um, one idea is a concurrent operator that basically returns some sort of split version of a flow. You perform your transforms and then we merge back into a flow. Another idea resembles flat map merge where we have this sort of section where we describe the transforms, um, but we're not actually using the sort of tacking on builder functions that operate and cascade down our flow. Um, both are pretty cool ideas, but all of these designs ask a lot of questions. Um, should order be preserved? If we're doing things concurrently, you know, there's no guarantee that order is preserved. So should we build that into uh, th this operator? Should it be an option like a Boolean where we can toggle it on or off? What's the return type? Does re concurrent return a flow or does it return some sort of set of concurrent flows that have to be merged back together? And, and if so, where does concurrency end? If you forget to call merge, uh, what happens? Also, if we have collect, is collect concurrent as well? Or is it just the operators that happen within the concurrent operator? So a lot of cool, really, really cool design questions are going on there. Um, I hope on the horizon, we might have some built-in concurrency operators for flow that allow us to tackle these challenges but know that we have a reliable implementation of this pattern that we don't have to implement ourselves. So um, I used a lot of photos in this talk. Um, I wanna make sure I give credit to everyone that provided these photos uh, online. And then beyond the talk, um, if you have any questions that you forget to ask on Slack or after the conference, you can uh, reach out to me on Twitter and then you can also go to my GitHub to see the four repos I went through, basically maps for the state flow, for the shared flow, um, the user flow, where it was just a regular uh, cold flow in this case, and then the Meteor uh, repository. Um, yeah, um, thank you for everyone attending, and I'd be happy to answer some questions. Awesome, thank you so much. That was such a great talk. Those visualizations are definitely very helpful for understanding these things. Awesome. Um, that everyone remember you can drop any questions that you might have in the Slack channel. Um, I'll wait a second to see if any of those come in. Um, and I know that there are some requests to share those repos. Would be, you be up to just dropping those links in the channel at some point? Yeah, I'm definitely gonna do that. I was gonna do that before awesome. and I forgot. <laughs> awesome, yeah. Um, no, it's super easy to let that slip before the talk. Um, cool. So we have questions coming in to start with. Does state flow overlap much with Rx Java use cases? Um, kind of like a blanket question there. Yeah. Um, so I know a lot of the design of flow that Rx Java was one of the inspirations for any particular operator. Um, so there, there is a, a, a lot of the care that went into Rx Java was brought into uh, the, the Kotlin coroutines library. I, I can't say that anything maps one to one. You know, 
the, the engineers behind Kotlin coroutines definitely wanted to build something that was theirs, that they felt was built well and that they owned. So they weren't trying to just copy, you know, one to one. But um, with that said, you know, Kotlin coroutines has a ton of operators that convert back and forth between the objects that we had in RxJava. Um, so you can you, you can pick and choose. You can have both and the converter functions back and forth are there. Um, so I, I kind of dodged the question a little bit. Um, they, they accomplish similar things where we're trying to have a more reactive architecture. They're not necessarily one-to-one -one in terms of how they're implemented, but they work really well together and accomplish the same asynchrony or, or at least reactive asynchrony that we want. Nice, awesome. Um, another question, what's the best example for combined latest in coroutines? Combined latest. What's the best example? Um, I mean, so combine itself, I know, is, is great because when we have multiple sources of data, we can basically merge them into a single combined object and we limit the number of flows that we have to observe. That, that model doesn't necessarily scale when we have lots of teams working on a particular app, but that's when combine really shines. Um, I haven't used combine latest actually, so I, I don't wanna say something wrong about that. Um, but you know, combine is a, combine really fits in really well when we have sort of that unidirectional flow where we only wanna have one state object. Um, yeah. Awesome, thank you. Um, everyone, you can continue to put those questions in the channel and we can answer them um, asynchronously there. Um, and until then, thank you very much, Ryan, for uh, giving your talk. And everyone else, we will be back here in about nine minutes. Um, feel free to fill your drinks, stretch your legs. Um, if you haven't visited the expo, go ahead and do that. Um, it's in the sidebar on Hopin, um, click expo and um, explore our wonderful sponsors. And with that, see you all soon.